welcome to a new season of Science Cafe here at Magpie's Pizza. As you're probably all aware, the theme for the series this fall, 2014, is extreme weather. I am very pleased tonight to introduce Jonathan Overpeck. It's uh, pretty amazing to me to be able to talk about climate extremes with what's been going on in our weather in Arizona. Um, because we've had record large hurricanes in the Eastern Pacific. Uh, we had the biggest early season storms ever this year. These are not the storms that are cruising up here right now. We've also had record intense rainfall uh, just a couple weeks ago up in Phoenix and also here as some of these uh, storms move up through Baja and Mexico and get mixed in with our monsoon system. And in the past, this has always been something that uh, really kicks off later in the monsoon season when we get frontal storms coming down, the, the, you know, the first winter storms coming down into this region. Um, so there could still be some really exciting things yet to come for our region. And paradoxically, we're in the largest, the longest, worst drought the Southwest has seen since we had rain gauges in the Southwest. So it's quite a good time to be talking about extremes and talking about how climate change is going to come home to roost for us in the Southwest. We already are, we being the climate science community, are confident that the Southwest is... Uh, pretty much the bullseye of climate change in, this, in the United States so far, and that um, that will likely continue into the future. And the fact that all this stuff is, was predicted when I was a grad student years ago is now actually happening, as the models said it would, gives us a lot of confidence that the projections of future change, like we're getting already only worse, is those projections are pretty good. So let's take a quick uh, tour through the kinds of climate extremes that are important to us in the Southwest. I won't talk about rapid increases in sea level, uh, sea level and how that's going to be flooding a lot of our coastal regions. Uh, but if you um, think about it, everybody should be paying attention to that too, since that's going to the costs of dealing with that sea level rise are going to be enormous and no doubt everyone in the United States will have to pay for those. Okay, so what does it all mean for the future? You know, the pictures I have here is just a picture of the Rio Grande during the height of the drought last year. Uh, this is Odile, the storm that is um, giving us moisture now, a very large hurricane, the largest ever to hit Cabo. Um, and, of course, the floods in Phoenix recently. Okay. This was in the news earlier this summer. Um, a rating firm, Fitch Ratings, which of course is the kind of company that informs bonds and, and ability to borrow money for um, all sorts of things, um, said a continued drought or permanent shift in weather patterns in the southwest U.S. could impact development activity and growth in Arizona and Nevada's major cities. Okay. What they're saying is if this continues, they're already saying this, we're likely to have a, a rough time getting money to support economic growth in our part of the world. Is that good news? No. The good news, according to them, is that, however, they're saying that this impact on Las Vegas and Phoenix and Tucson will not be uh, felt for probably the next 10, 15 years. And I think that is a pretty optimistic view of things, right? Because what happens if we have a really lousy snow season this winter and the Colorado River goes into shortage? You'll see what I mean later in this presentation. But keep this in the back of your mind. How long will we keep getting money invested in this region with what's going on? Okay? So today what I'm going to do is try and translate our best climate science into betting odds, okay? I learned to do this when I made a trip to Vegas early in my career here in Arizona, and it seems to be a really nice way to look at climate change. 
because we're all in our day-to-day -day life making little bets. I, I'm betting I don't need to bring my umbrella. I'm betting I can go through that wash, okay? So we're used to this kind of thing in our day-to-day -day life and, of course, in our jobs. So what does climate change mean for Tucson, the Southwest, and the globe? Well, particularly climate extremes. Okay, I'm going to look just at four climate extremes. Okay. The first one is more frequent and longer warm spells and heat waves. And probably everybody who's been watching the news over the last 10 years knows that we're getting some awesome or conversely devastating hot spells around the world. Um, one back in 2003 or five, three I think, in Europe. It resulted in France, which relies on nuclear energy to have to shut down a lot of the nuclear power plants or dial them back. It was so darn hot. And then a few years later, there's one in Russia which had enormous uh, impacts, including wildfires. Okay. So what I want to do, though, is take the look at the climate consensus on these events. And I want to look at three things for each one of these extremes. Is it happening? In other words, can the scientists detect a change in climate? Second, can scientists detect a human influence on that change? And third, what does it mean for the future in the Southwest? Okay, in the case of more frequent and longer warm spells and heat waves, it's kind of a slam dunk. It's really clear the planet is warming up. It's warming everywhere except maybe over the North Atlantic. That's why it's called global warming. And with the warming in mean annual temperature, average temperature, are these um, much more dramatic periods of hot temperatures, the heat waves. Okay, so is it happening? Definitely. In many regions, Australia, Europe are the most uh, um, newsworthy, literally causing uh, thousands of deaths. But also here in the Southwest, where we're kind of resilient to excess heat, but we've been getting a lot of heat that we didn't get even when I first came to Arizona 15 years ago. Are humans driving this? Absolutely. As the average temperature goes up, the extremes should also go up, and that's what's happening. And is it likely for the Southwest to continue? Almost a sure bet. I'll bet my house. That kind of bet, all right? Here's just plots showing the regions of the world on the maps that are getting increases in extreme warm nights and extreme warm days. The red or the yellow, redder colors are the are sort of the s how big the change is. If it has stippling on it, those in your front can see the stippling. That means it's statistically significant, the trend. And these time series or curves here going back to 1950 show for a variety of different clim uh, data sets the change in these two indices, warm nights, extreme warm nights, and extreme warm days. And you can see pretty clearly that it's been going up over the world. And you can see on the maps where it's been going up. So we've been getting warmer nights here, and everybody knows that. Um, but we haven't really gotten hit nearly as hard as, say, Eurasia, Europe, and Northern Africa. And, you know, in, in Australia, um, there are other parts of the world that are getting hit a lot harder than we are. That doesn't mean that we won't get hit just as hard, uh, but it means that, you know, because this is called global warming, this is a, a problem we will share with pretty much everywhere around Earth. It's worth showing this, though, that the uh, cold nights, you know, the freeze spells that we don't like if you, have, if you garden like I do for sort of warm plants, uh, those are going down. But bear in mind that we'll still continue, like we just saw in recent winters, we'll still get the freezes. And we'll probably still get those breezes, freezes for decades. And there'll just be a lot less of them. Okay? So don't say it's good times now for citrus. We still will get those freezes. Um, and, but it's clear that the climate of the earth is changing. Okay. Extreme number two. More frequent, intense, and amount of heavy precipitation. 
Well, this is what it's all about in Arizona this year. We've broke the record for the most intense rainfall ever in Phoenix, and they got all in the national news, but we did it in Tucson too. It's just we're a little tougher than those guys in Phoenix. Okay, so it's definitely happening. It's happening around the globe. It's hard to say it's happening everywhere, but it's happening in many places. And yes, we have pretty good confidence, medium confidence, that it's due to humans. And the reason for that is that, for a variety of reasons, um, but the, the reason it's happening is as the atmosphere warms up, it can hold more moisture. You know, it's a simple relationship that was predicted long ago, decades ago. And, it, and we can observe it. The atmosphere is holding more moisture. So when you can squeeze that atmosphere and wring out moisture, in other words, a monsoon storm coming up against the Sata Canalinas, or a front coming in, or a tropical storm, anything that provides conditions for rainfall, you're squeezing an atmosphere that has a lot more moisture in it. And as temperature increases, moisture content will go up, so we should see a continued trend to more and more intense precipitation, which means for a given rainstorm, there should be more rain. And therefore, we should see more and more floods. One thing that's good in part about this story, both with respect to droughts and floods, is that we have quite a good infrastructure in the Southwest so that we can handle uh, some pretty serious flooding and we can handle some pretty serious droughts. But the question I would pose for everybody in the room is when will we sort of overwhelm our infrastructure and get in some serious trouble? And with respect to drought, I think that could happen pretty darn soon, uh, even next, this next year. And with precipitation, it happened in Phoenix this summer. Okay, So it's a sure bet. It's happening. The model said it would happen. It's happening. I think we should, under, you know, we should have faith in our science there. This just shows you where we have seen this increase in precipitation. Uh, the blue areas and the blue areas with crossing are where it's statistically significant. You can see um, a large parts of the northern hemisphere where the signal is robust. Bear in mind that many parts of the world don't have enough precipitation data going back far enough that's of high enough quality to be able to say whether we're seeing a change or not. And that's true for much of the southern hemisphere and the tropics. So the lack of blue on this map for some land areas isn't necessarily a lack of, of um, an increasing precipitation, it's a lack of, of data. Okay, extreme number three. I'm going through this fairly fast and we'll have lots of time for uh, discussion. Is an increase in intensity and duration of drought. This is my, f my own research. It's really focused on drought in my laboratory and some of my graduate students who, by the way, do all the work, um, they're here. Um, and it's really fascinating what we're finding out here on drought. We're finding out something fundamentally different from what um, the literature has suggested is the case with drought, um, and we're finding the risk of future drought, particularly the longer droughts, what we've called mega drought, is substantially greater than people thought or that our climate models suggest should be the case. Okay? But first, let's just look. Are we seeing an increase in drought in some regions? I mean, is it happening? Yes, in some regions, but it's hard to detect. So, for example, in the southwest, if you look at drought, going from 1950, drought area or drought frequency or drought severity, any measure from 1950 to present, you don't see a big change. Does anyone know why? Back in the 1950s, we had a really serious drought in the southwest. And now we're in a drought that's a little more serious, but only a little more serious. And it's made more serious not by the precipitation deficit, as much as by the temperature, which has increased about two degrees Fahrenheit in the southwest. So if you just look at precipitation, 1950s and now, we're both really dry. But now it's a lot warmer, and that's why we're seeing more trees being killed. That's why we're seeing a lot of trouble on the Colorado River in terms of lack of water. Okay. That makes it a little harder to say, are we seeing human impacts? But the flip side of all this is that because of the large temperature impact of in this current drought, scientists have been able to say this drought has been made worse by humans. Little doubt. 
it's hotter and now all that heat is melting snow that's giving us less water um, and it's killing trees and it's giving us more wild wildfire so the heat and the fact that we have such confidence in the warming going on here tells us we have confidence in droughts are getting more severe likely in the future almost a sure bet again because we know temperatures are going to go up okay they have been going up they've been going up fast the model suggested they should everything agrees you can bet a lot on this okay i wrote a paper last year on the challenge of hot drought and that's the key that a lot of my colleagues don't understand they look at drought and they look at a, a meteorological definition of drought, lack of precipitation. But really when it comes to people and what they care about, drought is a combination of precipitation and temperature. You manage a forest, it's nasty if it's a hot drought, right? It's just like trying to garden here in Tucson in the summer. Those really hot days mean you have to just dump enormous amounts of water on your, your garden to keep it from wilting. And that's what's going on with our forests. Also, the heat is having a huge impact on snowpack up in the upper Colorado Basin, Colorado River Basin, and that means less stream flow in our rivers, Colorado or the Rio Grande. So that's the hot drought challenge, the global warming drought challenge, or as Dave Brashears at the University of Arizona said, the, the global change drought challenge. And it's very real, and it's racking up billions of dollars. And I saw a number I almost decided to put in here for the drought in California just this year, you know, in excess of 10 billion damages. So these are big numbers. Here's the current drought. Um, and you can see that it extends all the way up into the northwest through into Texas. The darker the colors, the worse the drought. The drought's moved around in terms of where it's been worse. It started in 1999, so it's the longest drought we've had since we had rain gauges deployed. Um, and it's really hammered different parts of the southwest. But Arizona, being in the middle of this, has pretty much been in drought every year since 1999. And... Uh, of course, California is just getting hammered, and everybody wants to know what's going to happen next year. And it all depends on this winter. We could discuss that if we want. Okay, here's Lake Powell. It's been as low as 39% of full. Um, now it's come up a little because we had a decent winter last year. Not a big snowfall, but a better than average. So it's, it's, a little, it's a little up. But you can see the bathtub ring, and we're still only half full. This is the uh, uh, curve showing since the, when we started filling um, Lake Mead, the place that um, Vegas gets their water, um, we built Hoover Dam. We called it Boulder Dam back then. Um, you know, it was to get out of the depression and we had jobs and everything. But it also was a very visionary thing in terms of water supply. And, and you can see in 1970, roughly, we started building uh, the Glen Canyon Dam, and then it filled up with Lake Powell. So these are the two biggest reservoirs in the United States. And during the 80s and 90s, with a little dip in the, around 1990, these guys were full. And when I moved to Arizona in 1999, I went to Vegas and gave a talk about drought. And everyone was very courteous and everything, but they were pretty happy because these storage units, the biggest in the United States, were absolutely full. And they didn't think they had any problem. And I talked about how they had a problem. They have droughts. And don't get too cocky about your water supply. And then in 1999, about the same time I gave that talk, usually when I talk about drought, it starts to rain and rain and rain. This case, it stopped raining. And we had 15 years of drought. There's some good years and some bad years. But now we're basically back to the level when all we had was Lake Mead. In other words, that half of the storage is gone, all right? So um, the question is, where will we go next? We're very close, just 10 feet in water level in Lake, Powell, in Lake Mead away from a shortage, an official shortage that water managers didn't think would happen until the 19, I mean, the 2020s. We're very close to that. We could get there next year. And when that shortage occurs, Arizona loses half of our Colorado River water. 
because we had to give that senior rights to California to build the CAP or the Central Arizona Project. Vegas also loses a lot of water. So Vegas and Phoenix and Tucson will put together militia and we'll get California. No, I'm just kidding. Right? But this is serious stuff. This is a lot of water. Okay? We can talk about how we're going to deal with that if you want. This is another way to look at the drought. This is just looking at large wildfires in the West. Just for the period 1984 to 1911, I mean 2011, I don't have the updated map. Um, and all the colors on there, brown and green, show where we have forests in the Western United States. The brown are the forests that have been burned. In addition, there we could, and I haven't seen this map, but we could also show forests that have died outright because of the hot drought and also that have been killed by insect infestations. So any of you who live in Colorado and go vacation up there like I do knows that there are extensive forests up there that should also be brown just because the insects killed them. Right? But this is, I think, a tip of a tipping point. In other words, it shows that it's not just drought that matters, it's the temperature. Okay. And we recently published a paper with Julie Vano, a, a former grad student at the University of Washington, talking about what could happen to the Colorado in the future. And we came up with a new estimate that with every degree warming we get in the future, the Colorado River stream flow will go down by six and a half or as much as nine or 10 percent. Okay? And we're expecting if we let climate change rip, business as usual as we are now, we'll get six or seven degrees warming by the end of the century up there, maybe five. A lot less water in the Colorado, even before you factor in drought. And that's where we get to this new thing. If you've been watching the newspaper uh, a week or so ago, um, this new paper that a bunch of us published, work of a graduate student at the University of Arizona, talking about this concept of mega drought. And Toby Alt, who's now a professor at Cornell, was here just a few years ago. He had a great quote on the front page above the fold in USA Today, the great white sharks of climate, powerful, dangerous, hard to detect before it's too late. They have happened in the past and they are still out there lurking in what is possible for the future, even without climate change. Isn't that great? This guy is inspired. And I think we have a lot of inspired grad students at the University of Arizona who will come up with, you know, really good uh, sound bites like that. But it's key. Point here is even without climate change, we got to be worried about this. It is a no regret strategy for us in Arizona. Even if you have friends who still have their head in the sand, don't believe in climate change, you can tell them, you know, these droughts happen, these mega droughts. We better be prepared for them. And that will help us get ready for climate change, even if they don't know it. We're kind of tricking them, right? Because we really could get hammered if we're not ready for these long droughts. And as I've been emphasizing over and over again, these droughts could be a lot worse with the warming. We control the warming, but unfortunately, we do not control these mega droughts. They will happen. Okay? The chances, also in this paper that got all the press, the chances of a three decade long mega drought this century range from 20 to 50 percent. All okay? right? So we're going to get one of these things uh, probably while some of the younger people in this room are alive, and maybe while the rest of us are alive. Maybe this drought is going to go on for another 20 years. We don't know. And certainly with the heat and the excess warming due to climate change, these droughts are going to be more and more devastating. Okay? So my last extreme, which is relevant to this and the rain we're going to get in the next couple days, increase in intense tropical cyclone, or we call them hurricane, activity. Okay? Is it happening? The only place in the globe where we have a good enough record going back far enough to say it's happening is in the Atlantic. It seems there that it's clear that the tropical uh, cyclones or our hurricanes are getting stronger. Now we've been really lucky because this year there's been like 50% of normal activity. Um, but remember back to Katrina and Rita in 2005. Those two category five storms hit the United States. It's the first time we've had two hit the United States. 
that's more of what we're talking about here. And even though the storms aren't hitting the United States, when they occur, there's a higher probability that they will be stronger, winds and precipitation, rainfall. Are we seeing a human impact? Again, it's highly debated. In the Atlantic, scientists are kind of leaning in that direction, but we're not sure. The rest of the world, we just don't know. And so data aren't good enough. It's hard without satellites to really measure where these things are and how strong they are, because they're out there in the ocean. Hmm. Likely for the Southwest, well, we're not obviously, we're, they're not going to make it in here, but it's these remnant storms like we have now and we had a couple weeks ago that are really key for the Southwest because these bring huge amounts of moisture up here. They either combine with a monsoon or they combine with a frontal storm if they happen a little later in September and they dump and they give us the big rainfall events. And it's pretty good bet, I would say. I'm not saying it's as good as the temperature increases or the drought or but it's a pretty good bet that we're going to get more intense precipitation. Okay? So what's the bottom line? You know, every time I talk to the media and I talk to someone today, you know, is this storm climate change? I side with my colleagues who say, well, probably everything has an element of climate change now. We've really altered the global climate system. But is this storm, would it have happened without climate change? Yeah, it could have. We can't really tell for an individual storm whether or not climate change, anthropogenic climate change, is the cause or not. Probably just a contributor, okay? So what's the bottom line? This is what I like to say. The recent changes, what we're seeing in the Southwest, the, dr the mega drought, the dr long drought, the hot drought, the intense precipitation breaking the rainfall records, these more intense storms affecting us, the big dust storms, which go with the drought, the big fire that go with the drought, hopefully not big mosquito outbreaks and disease that go with the, the rainfall. All of these things are what climate change will look like in the Southwest. So climate extremes are kind of the way we really feel viscerally climate change. People will often say, oh, what's a couple degrees of warming? This is a couple degrees of warming, and we're going to get a whole lot more. Okay, they will get worse. So for example, these are our daily uh, you know, temperature extremes and how they might change by the end of the century. The biggest uncertainty turns out is how much greenhouse gas, CO2 primarily from fossil fuel burning, how much will we put in the atmosphere? That's the big unknown. That's the thing we collectively control. We have our hand on the thermostat or maybe you think of it as your foot on the pedal. By the end of the century, if we continue on the path we are now and just let climate change rip at the, at the pace we are now ripping, burning coal, burning oil, letting it go, we'll get an increase in the southwest of about 15 degrees in terms of our hottest temperatures. You like that? You know, that's why I was quoted a while ago in Phoenix saying, you know, yeah, Phoenix is going to temperatures of 130. This is not the extreme. This is, this is an average of 18 models, and anyone in the room who knows when you do an average, you reduce, you take out the extremes. Some models are saying a lot more than this, some are saying less. But our best estimate, 15 degrees by the end of the century. It will, all right, it'll be pretty damn hot. And think of that, and we could also look, and I'm not showing this, how many days above 100 degrees or 110 degrees. There'll be as many days above 110 as there are now above 100. This place will be cooking. Okay, so I'm going to stop there, and we have plenty of time for discussion, I hope. Um, and you can ask me about the good news if you want, hint, hint. Um, you can also follow me on Twitter, and, you know, you'll obviously, if you don't do Twitter already, you'll start to see a lot of other folks who, who uh, tweet on climate, and you get this kind of information and an update on this kind of like continuously. And it, it's pretty fascinating to see what a lot of scientists think about What's this storm doing, et cetera, et cetera. Thank you.